All right, welcome and thank you for joining our webinar today. Becoming a Third Party Warrior, featuring both Nasser Fatah and Brenda Ferraro. Nasser is the former Managing Director for Information Security at Mitsubishi UFJ Financial Group, and Brenda is Prevalent's very own Vice President of Third Party Risk. My name is Peter Schumacher. I'll be serving your, as your webinar host for the day. I've got a couple housekeeping items to go over before we get started. Uh, so first of all, this is a reminder that all attendee lines are muted, and that's in an effort to keep um, the background noise down. Um, also, to keep this session interactive, we do invite you to submit your questions using the Zoom console. Um, at the end of the, the hour, we're going to try to get to those questions uh, and host a live Q&A. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded, so in the next day or so, you'll receive a follow-up email and a link to that recording. I know you didn't join to hear my voice or see my face today, so at this point I'd like to turn things over to Nasser and Brenda. Thanks so much for joining and please take it away. Thank you, Thank Peter. You, Peter. So Nasser, it's really good to be on this webinar with you. I have completely missed our time in person. We would get together annually at the Shared Assessments Conference and have opportunities to sit up late at night pondering over theories and conceptual and market leading type of situations. So this is gonna be my time to talk to you in front of everyone as if we were sitting in those late hours talking about what we need to do next. So all of us have heard about the pandemic and COVID and how do we, the dust is settling and what do we do next? So I'm really looking forward to having this conversation with you. So thank you for joining. Thank you for having me. So let's get started. We'll, we'll dig right in. Um, I, I was thinking about going back to the basics, and I think that going back to the basics is, is simple in words, but maybe difficult in action. So what are the basics of third-party risk, in your opinion, and supply chain risk, and how do we manage that? That's a, a good question. I think, you know, going back to basics is always important because basic is fundamental. It's what establishes our foundation. And you usually work off of your foundation once you have uh, a solid foundation, right? And uh, let me kind of just quickly recap, and I'm sure most of us uh, heard this before, but, you know, there are many reasons and many drivers why businesses uh, need to collaborate and partner with third-party vendors. And, and it can be to provide better customer support, customer support, um, be able to access new innovations, uh, generate revenue, reduce costs, as well as remaining competitive. So there's reasons why uh, we are collaborating with third parties and why we see them as our partners. And to me, a, a key objective of a, a third party uh, a third party risk management program is to be able to identify and manage those risks associated with third parties, including supply chain. And that's because if you fail to identify uh, those third party risk, it can have significant impacts on organization. Uh, it can impact your customer operations, reputation, financials, regulatory, and so forth. Um, plenty of impact here yeah, when it's been managed. Uh, so going back to the basics, I, I would say, you know, um, a, a policy that clearly calls out uh, what constitutes a vendor in your organization. Uh, that's really important. In some regulatory spaces, our regulators have already done that for us, where they define what is a vendor. Uh, but again, important to know uh, what a vendor uh, happens to be. Uh, the other one I would say is having a, an accurate rim inventory, uh, making sure that you get visibility, because if you don't have visibility, then you cannot manage the risk. Followed by that is tiering your vendors based on criticality. What is the impact of that vendor if something was to awry? Would it impact your financials? Would it impact your operations, regulation, uh, privacy, security? Those things are really important, and this is why you need to hear your vendors. Uh, you also need due diligence uh, to be able to identify risk. And ongoing monitoring, because the threat landscape is constantly changing, and there's new regulations that come out, as well as uh, the business may be changing uh, their business model with that vendor. Uh, at one time, they might have not been giving them uh, much information and decide to give them more information in a later time. I know I'm getting um, some feedback on the audio. Uh, is my audio getting any better? It's a little bit choppy, so I'm not sure if by calling in via the cell phone might work, but 
While I address this question, you can um, try to dial in or we'll just have you sit closer. It looks like you've gone on mute for a second. So some of the things that I think about with regards to the basics is, of course, you talked about this, NASA is inventory. If you don't even know your third parties, how can you even attempt to address your fourth parties, your fifth parties, and your nth parties? And the tiering approach, now that the dust is starting to settle or we're going through a different type of economic situation, we're really seeing a risk model and a tier model change. Everything that we thought was really important still is, but now we're looking at here are some different key controls that need to be applied along with contracts and how are we looking at those contracts in the event that a company is impacted and ongoing governance of all of those items. So many companies have different approaches of looking at risk. One of them, of course, is a risk-based approach. Another one could be compliance and re regulatory approach, or some, some of them are combined. But we really have to figure out based on each of those industries and companies what's important to them, identify the key controls and what's been adjusted, really look at that vendor universe. So many companies I've been talking to are saying we've had procurement systems, there's multiple procurement departments. And within those procurement departments, we're identifying exactly who's important, who's not important, where we're spending money. And so that vendor universe is critical. And there's two approaches to looking at that. You can do some type of an essential situation where we look at the business telling us what the current attributes are that are important for us to do proper due diligence. And in some cases, it's even better to do the reverse of that and go after the vendors to say, hey, we're in a business resilient situation. I need for you to confirm or tell me what kind of business you do with us. And we're gonna get back to you if we need any more content from you. So looking at the essentials and tiering and those types of things. Um, another thing is how quickly can we onboard? customers and vendors and, and those engagements, and then having a reporting uh, capability for KRIs and KPIs. So Nasser, I see that you're not on mute anymore. Uh, try to speak and see if we've got a more clear connection. Can, can you hear me better now? Yes, that was perfect. Oh, perfect. So on your toes, technical fix. Good job. Okay. No, thank That's you. Good. I just, uh, yeah, let me just revisit a couple points. So totally agree with the inventory. And again, we're talking about the basics here that are extremely fundamental, right? Because we need to build that foundation so we can have a healthy third party risk management program. So uh, totally agree on uh, the inventory, risk based in that inventory based on criticality, uh, doing your due diligence so you can identify risk, uh, ongoing monitoring because threat landscape is constantly changing. There, there might be new regulations. And as you have that basic or that program being put together, also making sure that you have executive sponsorship uh, you definitely need uh, a budget uh, so you can have staff and establish a healthy program. Uh, definitely governance uh, so you can report on what is your vendor portfolio risk, uh, not only to the executives, but to the board if you happen to have a board. And I think as you put a program together, as we all know, it always has to provide business value uh, because you want your businesses to adopt uh, your program. And the way businesses adopt program is when there's value. So. As you put the program to, uh, together, you know, what is the value uh, to your businesses? And I think Brenda hit a lot of them, including uh, timely onboarding, because uh, the business is often the case, time to market. Uh, I need to provide better customer service by this date. I need to generate revenue by that date. So I just wanted to echo and revisit some of the bullets you raised, uh, Brenda. Yeah, with that being said, we've got all of these different programs that are in place and policies and procedures and steps and workflow. And there's going to be a need to either continue as is just for the time or further embellish some of the steps that we take. So have you put some thought into what those types of things might be where we can leave them as is or what we need to embellish? Yeah, here's what I would say, and uh, I'm going to be broad about this, but we can always kind of narrow it down. I would say that as you put a program together, and we talked about some of the basics, there's always going to be opportunity to continuously drive efficiencies and maturity to the program. And that's because you always want to provide the best support to your businesses when it comes to third-party partners. So the fact that you have a program together, uh, there's always room for improvement. And I would say 
when you talk about embellishing, I, I would look at automation uh, as an example. You know, what is it about your program? And you really need to look at it from end to end, right? There's a lot of uh, subject matter experts that are involved. You can have cybersecurity, privacy, business continuity, and, and these are critical roles to partake on onboarding a vendor. But it's important to understand what is the end-to-end -end process. And then what is it about uh, those end-to-end -end processes that are very manual, that can be very lengthy? Uh, we know that contracting could be very lengthy. We know that uh, due diligence could be very lengthy. You know, what is it about those that we can uh, further streamline and still get the assurance that we're looking for when it comes to safety and, and soundness? So I would look at, you know, what can you automate uh, when it comes to manual activity? Uh, I would also say, you know, how do you use uh, technology uh, to collaborate uh, across your subject matter experts? So we are collectively doing our day-to-day -day activity uh, through the same technology, uh, being able to leverage the same documentation, the same evidence, be able to see each other's risk that sometimes provide us additional insight to what we're looking at. You know, very often I'm working very closely with other subject matter experts. If I raise a, a cyber concern, uh, or a potential cyber gap or risk, uh, I, I clearly see how privacy can take advantage of that, that compliance, business continuity, and to be able to work in that collaborative environment uh, using technology, uh, that's always a, a great opportunity. Uh, and then the other one would be further collaboration. As I mentioned before, uh, there are many stakeholders that are usually involved when it comes to onboarding as well as maintaining uh, a vendor, uh, those engagements associated with the vendor. We talked about uh, cybersecurity, privacy, business continuity, and so forth. Uh, there are many folks involved. You know, so how do you work across the table uh, with those partners that are involved in the pipeline to collectively help the end-to-end -end process? You know, an example would be, you know, driving uh, your core requirements in RFI in the procurement process, so that as they're shopping for prospects, as they're shopping for vendors. Uh, you're already driving what are your core requirements early on so that when you do your due diligence, uh, you're able to expedite that because hopefully in the RFI or RFP process, you've identified and gotten um, evidence to support the certain controls are in place early on. Again, be able to expedite the ensuing activity in a third-party onboarding process. Uh, up to uh, working with legals and driving uh, terms and conditions in their templates so you can minimize uh, the redlining and redaction and the ping pong that takes place between uh, our attorneys and the opposing attorneys. So there's definitely uh, opportunities there. And since you mentioned embellishment, I would say uh, risk management is always an area that um, there's always opportunities to look at. Uh, in this case, I'll use emerging threats like, you know, COVID-19. You know, how, uh, how is our risk management profile when it comes to third party? considering um, not only the existing uh, threats, but emerging threats. You know, today is COVID-19, tomorrow might be climate change. So those are the areas that I would say uh, are room for embellishment. And, you know, I associate this as continuous improvement, right? You, you, build, you put a program together, there's always room for improvement. Uh, how do you use technology to automate uh, manual activities? Uh, and there's uh, still manual activities. You know, a lot of third-party processing, and then uh, further collaboration so that the end-to-end -end process becomes further streamlined. Yeah, and I think building upon what you're talking about, the automation of those manual techniques, if you use an unconventional approach of making sure that you're able to, one, be able to get into the procurement life cycle of the RFX, whether it's a request for proposal, a request for information, and including that key control information in the scorecard, then you'll know what kind of a lift you have as you move forward with your selection process of who you're going to be engaged with. But again, the other thing that's interesting is that if you're able to configure any key control that you have with risk recommendations of how you expect those key controls to be mitigated if they come back as a missed or a vulnerability or an unfavorable response, whether it's a questionnaire or threat intelligence, then you have one voice across your company that's following the guidelines of your policies. And not only that, having a risk summary report that you can give back to the vendor that says, thank you for giving me your content. I've evaluated what I can see that against my risk tolerance and my risk appetite, uh, related to the relevance of the information that you've provided, here are the things that I need you to work on. And then tracking those to closures. 
So that's, that's interesting from an embellishment point of view. We've been doing a great job of identifying risk. Now we got to jump over the hurdle and say, okay, now that we've identified, here's how we're going to track it and govern it to completion. So if we go into the next question, um, we're in, we're in a new reality. I'm, I'm tired of saying our new norm. So we're in a new reality. And, and based on that, we have a triad of talent, tools, and techniques, or people, process, um, and tools. So how do you see that that change will, some changes that may or may not occur with that triad? Yep, um, good question. Um, I'll, I'll start with talent. So um, we have gone out, and when I say we, we collectively, including those on the call, you know, we have gone up, we've built a program, we've gotten subject matter experts involved, and those SMEs are very knowledgeable professionals. They know their areas inside out. Uh, what I would say is understanding um, emerging threats. Again, I'll use uh, COVID-19 as an example because that's in front of us. You know, uh, as a subject matter expert, you know, what is it about COVID-19 uh, that becomes a concern when you look at your third-party portfolio? Uh, as we know, we're all working from home. Uh, we're all spending more time on the internet today, as an example. And those things do present risk. Uh, yep, we want our staff to be productive, so uh, we need them to be connected uh, online, et cetera. Uh, but they do come with some risks that we need to kind of go back and revisit. It's not risk that we weren't aware of, it's just that risk that we have to kind of now further focus in. So I think as we look at talent is how quickly do we pivot with our subject matter expertise in identifying uh, emerging threats and how do we respond to them in a quick fashion. I would also tell you, in addition to emerging threats, also being apprised of emerging technology, or what I like to call disruptors. It doesn't have to be technology. It can be disruptors. And I'll give some examples because often our businesses are gravitating to these disruptors for more than one reason. And some of these disruptors are sometimes beyond us. But I'll give some examples. So when we look at disruptors such as emerging technology, uh, we know of cloud and Internet of Things. Uh, they are great in many different ways. Uh, however, like any emerging technology, they do come with their risks and threats and how do you uh, take your capability and further expand that so you can apply it to these emerging, emerging technologies. If you look at other types of disruptors which have nothing to do with emerging technology, like peer-to-peer -peer payment, it's just a, a service that a lot of organizations are gravitating to, especially with COVID-19 where people are not going to ATM machines and they still want to make monetary transactions through their phone, peer-to-peer uh, -peer payment, as an example, becomes a disruptor. And how quickly can you take your skill set and understand uh, what's in front of you from a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, peer -peer payment and understand threats and risks. And again, I'm just giving that as an example. And you can even have new regulations being a disruptor, right? Uh, GDPR, CCPA, rightfully so, uh, need to be in place, but they can be a disruption to your organization. And how do you take of uh, those disruptors and factor in, you know, what else you need to expand uh, when it comes to talent, uh, to controls, and, and things of that nature. Uh, so that wasn't a talent piece. It's basically, hey, we are professionals. We know our subject matter area inside out. Uh, it's how do you now continue to grow that subject matter expertise into areas such as uh, emerging threats and disruptors uh, that normally uh, happen in our organization and sometimes um, not normally, like COVID-19, yeah. uh, but something that we anticipate in the near future. Yeah, and before you go into tools and techniques, are you seeing the, the talent of the resources change from, I'm administratively collecting information to know what the risk is, versus I am now someone who knows what the risk is, excuse my frog, and how I'm going to address that. So they're moving from analysts to risk managers. Is that the case that you're seeing as well? I, I think that is the situation we need to be in, absolutely. I, I think we need uh, uh, to be very risk-oriented and understand uh, the risk, be able to speak to that risk uh, in business terms, uh, and be able to understand what are the appropriate mitigants uh, to address the risk to a satisfactory level. So, uh, like I said, you know, those of us who've been, in, who've been subject matter experts, again, using the example of... Uh, cyber, uh, privacy, compliance, this continuity. We know our stuff inside out. It's how do you focus those, uh, those capabilities? You know, how do you fine tune that lens when you're looking at um, emerging threats and these disruptors, uh, which some of them normally happen, like I said, uh, like cloud, and some of them uh, happen unexpectedly, like COVID-19. 
going on to uh, tools and techniques, and I'll bundle these together, and I think you heard me already say, but it's well worth, for me, uh, well worth repeating, and that is, you know, uh, tools and techniques to me comes back to, you know, how do you continue to automate so you can improve uh, efficiencies? And when I say improve efficiencies, I really mean, you know, um, how much of your work goes into administrative versus analytical versus and risk identification. If you were to break down your day-to-day -day activities as far as how you look at a third-party vendor, um, it can be a lot spent on just administrative, you know, opening up those SOC 2s, those pen tests, opening up those supporting documents and evidence. You know, uh, if technology can be leveraged um, to either uh, provide you that information in another format, or if technology can do some of that for you, do some of the analysis for you, so you can spend more time on understanding the risk at hand and then assisting with the risk decision, so I, I think that's where I would like to see tools and techniques to continue to go towards, you know, uh, enable me to do more risk uh, analysis, enable me to do more risk decisions, and let technology do uh, a bulk of the administrative work, uh, definitely some analysis work, and then uh, spit out something that I can say, yep, I can make a sound risk decision based on what I'm seeing in front of me. Yeah, I think with the tools and the techniques, people are starting to think of ways to marry all of the different tools together and identify a single pane that will give us the information that we need to see. And I think we're talking about that a little bit further in our discussion. But the, the manual activity and capturing those details, it's going to be important for us to get to a machine learning perspective so that not only can we look at a single vendor and what's happening with them, but then across our vendor portfolio in certain departments, certain compliance areas, and then furthermore, industry-wide and globally. So I'm looking forward to those tools and techniques to start getting inter more interconnection, more, more harmonizing. So if we yeah, go- and I would add, Yeah, let me just kind of go back and add something you're saying, then we can definitely jump up to the next slide. I, I do like uh, what you mentioned as far as machine learning, artificial intelligence. I think that those capabilities become really important uh, in order for us to become very data-driven, right? Uh, that's something that uh, I think that ultimately we all need to become very data-driven. Do we have the data, the right data in front of us so we can make uh, the right decisions? And going uh, back to something you said, you know, and how do we look at risk from a 360 point of view? Uh, you know, well, how do I look at vendor A's risk in comparison to vendor B risk? And then where am I aggregating uh, my risk unbeknownst to me? Where do I have my single point of failure? And I think technology, uh, machine learning, uh, with the right data can actually put that picture for us pretty quickly, you know, to be able to see if you have a vendor or even a subcontractor that might be a concentrated risk or a potential single point of failure. And again, it's very hard to do that if you have spreadsheets because you're not consolidating all your spreadsheets into a master spreadsheet so you can see that holistic view. So this is why, you know, keep going back to uh, technology, uh, definitely machine learning, artificial intelligence, as they get more and more indoctrinated into these two sets. And speaking of machine learning as well, so if we start looking at our third parties and our fourth parties and our nth parties, which is going to probably be something that the regulators start asking us to make sure we're doing so that if one company is impacted, how does that domino affect everything from the business to a product or a service being supplied out to whatever it is that we need to know from a, a data control perspective, what are some of the methodical guidelines that us as practitioners should use as we start to looking at repeatability and scalability and expanding to third and fourth parties and beyond? No, I, I agree. That That's a, a, a very, very... Uh-oh, lost your audio again. It Nasser? <laughs> Hold on a second. We can't hear you. Uh-oh. Looks like we need to get him to pull another audible. <laughs> Maybe he can go go back to his... Uh, back to his computer? His uh, computer connection. Yeah. <laughs> so, we, so, Nasser, I don't know if you can hear us, but you can hear very... Okay, now he's starting. Uh, I, I muted him. 
Okay. So it's getting scrambled. Let me let me unmute him and see how he's doing. Okay. Sounds like I went. There we go. No, there you're so much better. You got robot yep. and it sounded like you were you're pulling your laptop across your desk. <laughs> you know, you know what happened is my, my phone is connected to several Bluetooth devices and somebody might have turned one and immediately gravitated to that device. So sorry about that. Go. I don't know where I, I don't know where I left off, but I felt like I was on a roll. You, it was right at the beginning. As soon as I asked the question, just start over from scratch on this particular topic. Okay, this is the slide that we're talking about, the insuring repeatability and scalability. Yes. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, yes, and I know we mentioned four, I hear, you know, uh, if I read the question, and I apologize again for the two technical glitches I've already experienced. So uh, this is, I guess, part of the new norm. And again, my apologies for that. So uh, agree with you that repeatability scalability, sustainability are essential to a program. You know, if you've established an approach and a methodology, you want to make sure that those approach and methodology are repeatable, sustainable, scalable, uh, something that would determine the survivability of your program, uh, something that regulators zoom in very closely because they want to make sure repeatability and scalability as well as sustainability are kept uh, at the pace that you have uh, implemented them. And again, technology lends itself to that. As far as expanding uh, those capabilities uh, to your fourth party and beyond, uh, here's uh, what I would say. You know, first make sure that your existing program is in place and working to your expectation, working effectively with your third party before you start to expand that to your fourth party. You really want to solidify your program. You really want to be successful. You really want to be able to mature uh, your program where you feel very comfortable what you're doing with your third party so that you can go ahead and start to extend your program to fourth party. Uh, once uh, your program is in place and you're comfortable and you're ready to bring in your fourth parties, I would say start with your critical vendors. Uh, which of your critical vendors have fourth parties that you need to know? And because you've already established an inventory, again, part of having basics in your program, you can then add your fourth party vendors uh, that pertain to your critical vendors into your inventory as well as the metadata that will help you make risk decisions. You know, which of your third parties, third parties, or in this case, your fourth party, are having access to data, uh, your data in particular. You know, what geolocation are they in because there's some cross-border uh, rules that you may have to take into consideration, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, that becomes really important, you know, leveraging your existing inventory, so now you can also capture your fourth party. Uh, as far as identifying uh, who are your fourth parties, I would say that can be a multitude of sources, and you should have a, a multiple of sources because not one source will give you uh, accurate and ongoing uh, fourth party information. Uh, I would say uh, if you collect SOC 2 reports, as an example, in SOC 2 reports, you would have uh, fourth parties enumerated in those. Uh, I happen to like to include in our contract when we're doing business with a third party a clause that clearly calls out no subcontractors. And it's not because I'm against subcontractors. It's because that clause enables me to now have a healthy dialogue with a third party when they say, no, I do have subcontractors. And now is an opportunity to capture the subcontractors. What is those subcontractors are doing uh, with my data, uh, how do they play a part with products and services? Are they interacting with uh, my customers, et cetera? So again, I do have that clause in the contract, not because I am uh, unfavorable with subcontractors. It's kind of a gotcha for me when uh, legal comes back and goes, yep, uh, the third party we're about to do business do have subcontractors. It's an opportunity to trigger point. I also make sure that, you know, if you are going to have subcontractors, which you will, that whatever contractual terms and conditions uh, you have uh, uh, applied to your third party, and those can be a slew of terms and conditions from privacy to cyber to business continuity, that those uh, terms and conditions are also applicable to their fourth party. So it's something that you have to uh, make sure contractually speaking is in place. And then I would also say that uh, because your third parties do have fourth parties, they should also have a third party risk management program that meets your expectations and be able to share results of their third party with you so you can feel comfortable that not only do they have a program, but that they also are assessing uh, those vendors in a way that meets your uh, expectations 
Uh, lastly, I would say that, you know, uh, vendors are our partners, right? Uh, we need to, uh, we do business with them because uh, they help us do better business, uh, for lack of a better word. So vendors are our partners. So important that we build relationships and continue to build relationships with our vendors so we can also understand, you know, uh, what is it about their subcontractors? Are they changing subcontractors? All those things become really relevant, and building those relationships also helps uh, with, identifying uh, fourth parties that may be essential to you. Yeah, I think that the concept that we talked about before with regards to being able to see your third parties, your fourth parties, your nth parties, your business units, where data is transferring, what product or service is being provided. If you pull on one of them, what's going to happen to all the rest? So the spider diagram of risk relationships and entity relationships and daisy chaining those together for interconnections is going to be critical and you can either ask that information using an outreach to either your vendor database or an in reach to your internal business units and get the attributes that you need to know but that's really really critical and it's something that people need to start thinking about i kind of have coined that um, maybe rightfully so or maybe i've heard it before somewhere else but we have a cmdb for things like this in in our networks and so what I've kind of coined it as is either a supply chain database or a third party risk management database. And that's what we need to start getting to is what is that database either internally or sector wide that we would be able to help each other know what's happening in each of those. So I, I totally agree with you that fourth party is important. And I'm sure one of the questions that come up at the end is going to be, I can't even get control over my third parties. So now you're talking to me about doing my fourth parties. How can you even broach that topic? because I'm stressed out just with third. So I'm sure that'll come up later, but let's kind of go into the multitude of products and how our third party risk management and governance programs need to start using those harmoniously and what you're seeing um, in your experience of that as a CISO today. Yeah, I, I would say that, you know, uh, when you look at products, and that will also include services, you know, if you have or looking to subscribe to uh, one of the consortiums that are out there, which provide services. I would say that when you're looking at uh, products and, and services, uh, you are basically looking for ways to help with your day-to-day -day activities. You're looking for those technologies, those products, those services to be able to facilitate what you need to do on a day-to-day -day basis. If they are introducing complexity, you just complicated your world unbeknownst to you. So you, you really have to look at it you know, how is this going to help me with my day-to-day -day systems? And then when you have a multitude of products, which is normal, uh, you may have a, a GRC, you may have continuous monitoring, you know, how do you make sure that they are working within your ecosystem, that they are working holistically, synergistically, that they're working in a manner that you can get a holistic view of your vendor, your vendor portfolio, ideally by going through uh, by going to a single pane uh, because if you have to go to and i'm exaggerating to make a point but if you had to go to five six seven eight different products to kind of put that picture together of what is your vendor risk profile it can be very painful you, you can't be able to uh, stitch that story together in a very cohesive way if you just run technologies and they simply don't talk to each other so i would say uh, as you look at your third party risk management program as you look at technology to come in and help you automate uh, your manual activities to facilitate uh, your day-to-day -day activities, that they work in a very synergistic way, that they are harmonious, that they can talk to each other as native as possible. Uh, I know uh, a lot of products not only natively talk to each other, uh, but they also have APIs uh, so that you can uh, configure them uh, to talk to each other. Uh, but ideally, if it comes out of the box, that's a wonderful thing, one less thing to worry about. And again, you know, I'm going back to, you, you have gone out and, and purchased uh, products, services, technology to help you uh, with your day-to-day -day activities, to help you identify risk, to help you uh, build inventory, to help you uh, do your job. Uh, so you got to make sure that that continues to be the premise of technology product service as you bring them into your program. Yeah, and I think that um, a lot of times we go and look at products and we check out what content they're providing to us, but we never ask the why question. Why is what they're telling me important? Do I need to know everything under the sun or do I need to know specifically what's relevant to the engagement or how do I slice and dice the information to, important to all the different departments that I have? 
So using threat monitoring in a single pane, having it API to GRC or IRM tools, and then even in the cases where we only get 50 to 65% of the scanning intelligence from the wild, we have to couple that and marry that and harm, harmonize that, if I can say the word today, um, with the questionnaires, with the policies and the procedures, do you have them in place? And we're going into a realm of, we can't do on-site visits. People aren't gonna let us on site. So using the virtual capabilities um, and making sure that either it's a GoPro or if it's clean room or the things that we need to see are still at our fingertips. So I really like what you're saying about take the tools, make sure that you're, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm interpreting what you said is take the information and make sure that it's relevant and see that in a single pane of glass so that you're removing the manual minutia of having to take all that information and figure out if it's cohesive or if it's saying that something was false when they said something was true and that kind of thing. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. You know, uh, I like to call it the 360 view, right? Um, I, I, let me see if I give you a perspective and I'm going to again exaggerate to make a point. You know, if, uh, if you had um, subject matter experts, uh, privacy, cyber, business continuity, again, using this as an example, if they had their own tools and these two didn't talk to each other, it would be very difficult for us to understand what risk and privacy I need to consider uh, from a cyber perspective. Uh, what risk in uh, cyber that business continuity might think is really relevant. You know, uh, I think of air gap as an example. You know, if there was to be ransomware, you definitely want to have uh, air gap. But if my silo solution is identifying ransomware concerns and business continuity is not able to see that, it becomes very disjointed. So, you know, I, I like to uh, advocate and push that these technologies talk to each other. Um, if you can do it through all one uh, technology, that'll be great. Uh, because in the end, if these can become collaborative too, that's what I like to call them. If they can become a collaborative too, so I can collaborate with all my risk partners and share um, not only evidence and documents that I have, but also see what they're coming up with because risks tend to interconnect with each other. You know, a risk in one area can likely impact another area. So those things become really effective. So kind of just underscoring uh, the comment you last made, uh, Brenda. So I, on the next topic, I have a very, very strong opinion about the difference between continuous monitoring versus continuous assessment. What is your take on those two very, in my mind, different approaches? I, I would say they are, and I'm going to let you comment on the differences because I also uh, see some differences. But let me see if I can uh, approach this uh, slightly different. So I, I would say that, you know, from a continuous monitor, continuous evaluation, um, primarily what we're doing here is getting very timely information on an ongoing basis. Because we know historically it has been cadence driven. I am going to look at my tier one vendors on a yearly basis, my tier two vendors every two years. So it has been very cadence driven. So when you look at CM and CA, are you looking at ongoing timely information? And you're doing that because the world changes, the landscape changes, the threat changes. So you want to know, you know, what are the new threats out there? Are there new vulnerabilities and we know there are new vulnerabilities not to pick on Microsoft but they push out patches every month and it's good that they do because they're addressing uh, the bugs uh, in the product but the point I'm trying to say is that there's always new uh, vulnerabilities and if you are not subscribing uh, to these types of solutions it's very hard to tell uh, what visibility you're getting there because if you're only getting um, the evidence and material once a year and that's the extent of it uh, there's a lot of things that might be missing that doesn't give you a complete risk profile of that vendor. And being able to get that type of information also helps when you go and sit down and have a constructive conversation with your vendor. So you can say, here's what we have identified, and here's what we want to confirm with you. And if it's a concern, here's what we want you to address. You can speak in a very data-driven kind of manner because the data is in front of you. Yes, it's important that you understand you know, how these tools are producing that data, how they're validating that data, because you definitely want to be able to have a dialogue with your vendor where it is productive. You don't want anyone to go in the wild goose chase, and, the, and in the end, it turns out to be a, a false positive. So 
it's important that as you look at these types of tools or any of the tools, that it is producing a level of assurance that meets your expectations. Uh, I would also say that, you know, we talked about earlier, how do you streamline uh, your basics, like your, your due diligence, uh, your ongoing monitoring? And I look at these capabilities as a way of streamlining that. Do I need to be able to do the cadence if I now have uh, another uh, approach that gives me the same level of assurance? Uh, do I need to now uh, do the same type of due diligence uh, across my entire portfolio? Can I leverage some of these capabilities either to shorten my due diligence, um, less coverage of my due diligence? You know, those things uh, help in ascertaining where can you streamline your due diligence. And then it also gives you uh, some trend analysis. I always like to look at trends, you know, assuming that the data that's in front of you that you've gotten from these services are giving you the right information, and often it is, uh, you know, what the trend has been. Is it something that's been out there for a day, a month, a year? Because that kind of tells you a lot uh, about how your vendors are treating that. Uh, and again, being able to have those data points, and I keep going back to data because data is really important, and be able to have that constructive conversation uh, with your vendors when it comes to uh, CM and CA. Uh, lastly, I would say, you know, as a, a person who has been doing tons and tons of due diligence and enjoy them in every which way and enjoy looking to see how to streamline due diligence because that is one of the longest legs for vendor onboarding. And how do you do that with, uh, with the same level of integrity and assurance that those things are fascinating to me. But I would say that the aspiration, uh, at least with me and most of my peers, is that we would like to do more continuous monitoring, more continuous assessment, and less due diligence the way we have been doing it historically, you know, the cadence and, and those types of uh, due diligence activities. Yeah, I think with continuous monitoring, I, both of these are important. None of them are more important than the others. So I completely agree with doing both. The continuous monitoring, you're right, from a threat intelligence perspective, having the information coming from the wild and telling us what has been scanned. The one thing that I look at very, very tightly is that if I'm getting information as threat feeds, am I able to digest the information rapidly? And is it telling me something that happened yesterday, like you should have had an umbrella because the storm was yesterday versus you're going to get impacted tomorrow and here's the things that are weak that you need to protect yourself from. So it's kind of like a hurricane is coming, get prepped. The continuous assessment and evaluation, of course, is just the same. This, the one and done type of questionnaires and finding out evidence and content is getting to the point where, okay, we have quickly identified inherent risk and now we have morphed rapidly into residual risk. And based on that residual risk, we are tracking those to completion. So people are gonna finish closing mitigation plans and landscape's gonna change. And so triggers have to be set within the program to say whether it's coming from threat intel or whether it's coming from risk mitigations being closed or whether it's coming from a threat landscape that has occurred those triggers are going to make it so that you need to continuously look at that vendor. You have an engagement with them. You don't just say, hey, I'm gonna work with you and then leave them in the cold from a maturity perspective on their security controls because things are changing all the time. So I really like the continuous assessment approach using monitoring and evaluation and whatever triggers we can set. No, no, I, I, that, that makes a, a whole lot of sense. And you hit the nail on the head, you know, the threat landscape is constantly changing. You know, I, I always like to take a risk-based approach, you know, understand what are my inherent risks uh, regarding that engagement, that engagement characteristics. Uh, what is it that's relevant when it comes to controls, to mitigate those controls? And then uh, what should the expected residual risk be? And those are important things and things that we must do so we can understand overall how we're managing the risk, right? Because that's what uh, third-party risk management is about. But, you know, even, even in addition to that, uh, if you've done a great job yesterday in doing that, and you should, uh, tomorrow uh, there might be a new threat that you have to kind of go back and look at and say, you know what, my inherent risk profile just changed. And if it has changed, I have to go look to see if the controls that I've looked at before, are they adequate enough? Do I need to supplement that with my vendor? And, you know, what, is the, what does the residual risk look like? Because exactly what you said, that the threat landscape can change. And though you might have done this uh, yesterday, something can change today, something can change tomorrow that may require you to kind of go back and see if you need to do any fine tuning. 
Yeah, one of the things with you talking about the data risk decisions, tiering and controls are starting to morph into our new reality to cover work from home and things like that. What are you seeing from a, a metamorphosis phase of where we need to go? Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll use the, uh, the work from home as an example. You know, we're working from home, our vendors are working from home, uh, and, and that's totally understandable. Uh, in some cases, you know, our vendors have primarily always worked in an office environment or worked in some kind of environment, but not necessarily from home. So once, that's a paradigm shift for a lot of our vendors, you know, having to work from home, uh, setting up VPNs, uh, cyber hygiene, you know, uh, bolstering their security awareness program so they can make uh, their staff and continue to make their staff their first line of defense, as an example, what I like to call the human firewall. Uh, all of those things become really essential to revisit uh, from a, a cyber perspective because we're spending a significant more time on the internet. Um, cyber criminals are intimately aware of that. Uh, they are aware that uh, when you spend more time on the internet, it's like being in a bad neighborhood. It's just a matter of time before you get victimized. Uh, so the longer you're in a bad neighborhood, the more likelihood that you're going to get victimized along the way. So. Uh, cyber criminals are, are very aware of that, and you know, cyber criminals are constantly sophisticating their techniques and tactics. So, again, you know, uh, these are the things that's important to kind of go back and revisit with your vendors. Hey, we know that your staff are, are working from home. What measures have you taken in place? What are you doing now? What are you doing in the near term, future term? Because uh, until we see a, a change in the landscape, uh, working from home uh, may be. Uh, here longer than not, as an example. And I'm just using working from home as an example uh, of COVID-19, right? I mean, uh, the, the other one, if you're looking at third party, would be, you know, understanding uh, their financial situation. And it sounds interesting because somebody would say, hey, Nasser, uh, you are a cyber person and a risk person. You know, what is it about finance? I would say that, you know, if uh, vendors are being uh, impacted because of financial constraints, uh, everything else uh, gets impacted by it. It's a trickle-down effect. Right? So if they are financially in strife, I'm expecting the cyber programs to start becoming weak, business continuity becomes weak, because that's what's expected. Hence, you know, again, going back to working very closely with your vendors for their success, because their success is our success, and building those relationships. And then, again, having these capabilities that you, Brenda, have been raising and I have been discussing as far as the uh, continuous monitoring and continuous evaluation, so that we continue to get that visibility and then know how to make a uh, risk-based decision uh, based on that visibility, and more important, be able to have the constructive dialogue with our vendors versus you know, not having that data. Yeah, so a very quick time check. I think we have two more topics to go over. And so what are the pressing cybersecurity action items that we should be using to invoke preparedness? Yeah, I would say, you know, uh, I, I want to go back to fundamentals. So when we look at, you know, uh, and this will be a cybersecurity program. This can also be a third party risk management program. You know, these, these programs have a, a level of how do you best prepare, right? And, and I would say uh, inventory. Um, like when I look at cyber, hey, do I have a, a clear inventory of my IT assets? Uh, do I know where these IT assets uh, live? Uh, what's the landscape like for these IT assets? And then associate, you know, the threats and vulnerabilities that are associated uh, with uh, IT asset in the landscape. And then because we are all in a third-party business, having to take that and extend it to your third-party partners. You know, uh, the, the fact that uh, I have a data center and I have all these controls around my data centers, I now also have to see how does my vendor have uh, controls around their data centers or if they're in the cloud like we're in the cloud, you know, how they are protecting uh, those digital, uh, those virtual assets uh, in those environments. So uh, being prepared uh, in that fashion is, again, uh, understanding uh, your IT assets, um, including inventory, the landscape, uh, associated threats and vulnerabilities. Uh, the other thing that I would also say in being prepared is, and I mentioned this earlier, you know, what is it about your business when it comes to disruptive technology, you know, uh, and how do we stay in front of that so that when they're ready to embark, when they're ready to do that time to market, uh, they definitely want to move quickly, uh, and you don't want to be uh, roadblocking them, right? So if they're going to the cloud, how are you lock and step with them from the very beginning? Uh, you don't want to be notified on the end of day when they say, hey, tomorrow we're going to be in the cloud and we need you to do an assessment. Uh, you're kind of at a disadvantage at that point in time. 
uh, I would say, you know, how do you lock and step with them in the beginning of that journey so that you can help them uh, with these disruptive technology? You know, I talked about emerging, such as cloud. I talked about business uh, disruption. You know, uh, I mentioned peer-to-peer. And even regulatory, right? Uh, when new regulations come out, like CCPA, how are you uh, at the table very early on uh, while uh, CCPA is being formulated before it gets finalized, discuss, having those conversations so you can make sure that your program is prepared and handling those things? And if not, where do you need to bolster your program accordingly? Yeah, and bolstering your program, first you should probably have some type of a maturity assessment that tells you where your program is. So there are many companies that do that. Um, Prevalent is one of them. And we actually do that for free right now. So find out how to get a maturity assessment so that you can know where to start. So let's talk about key takeaways in the next maybe like two minutes very quickly. What are your key takeaways from our discussion topics today? Yeah, I would say uh, I have three of them. Uh, I would say uh, I'll go back to the basics, you know, uh, inventory, inventory, inventory. Uh, two, uh, technology, you know, uh, automation. Look at uh, your processes, how manually intensive it is. You know, are you still doing a lot of sneaker netting through uh, emails uh, to get vendor documentation, things of that nature? Uh, are you still on spreadsheets? So look at technology. So, and the third one I would say is uh, make sure that your program is resilient and age out, I like to use the word age out in this particular case, when it comes to emerging threats. Uh, we're now experiencing COVID-19. Uh, a lot of the experts uh, are saying that, yep, there will be another pandemic in the near future. Uh, unrelated experts, but experts in another area would say, yep, climate change will be significant. And I'm not saying that will be the case. All I'm just trying to say is that in your risk management program, you need to make sure that it is uh, age out and open and broad enough to understand that uh, these risks, when they do materialize, have impact, and how quickly can you pivot uh, so you can keep your business running uh, when these things materialize. And my three would be know your third-party universe. Start with that. Um, ask your vendors. Don't feel afraid of doing that. Um, ask them what they're doing for you from a business resilience perspective, and then do proper due diligence based on their information if you can't get the intelligence from your business units. Um, it's the perfect time to start automating your workflow. Use a platform that gives you that 360 view that NASA calls it. Um, using threat intelligence, using questionnaires, having documents and artifacts. And then finally get a um, config configurable risk capability so that you have risk recommendations readily available to tell your vendors instantaneously once you know their security posture, what you need them to fix and how and in what timeline. And then continuously monitor and assess those so that you're not doing point in time and uh, whatever you evaluated yesterday is not gonna be what you want for today. So keep up with that. But Nasser, I um, really appreciate you having the time and talking with us and I hope we can do this again. I believe, Peter, we have a polling question and then if we have any time for questions, we can move into that. Yeah. Yes. Thanks for the uh, and, and sorry for the technical glitches. You yeah, know Peter. what? You are resilient. You perfected those technical issues as they were thrown at you, so no problem. You showed us how to just like leave charge and get it done. I That's you. right, yeah. Yeah, I, nobody heard my joke. I, I said you pulled an audible quite well. So thanks for doing that. Um, yes, we do have one polling question. I have a couple questions that have come in via the, the Q&A section in Zoom. So let me launch this poll. Um, we'll have that up in front of everybody. So please just take a minute to answer that question. And then I'll get straight to the Q&A. It sounds like you two uh, have a lot of good, good conversation here. You could talk for hours, I'm sure. But um, we'll get right to these last two questions, and uh, then we'll let everybody be on with their day. So first question is, any suggestions for classifying third parties by risk level and adjusting control requirements? So for example, vendors handling smaller quantities of data may not agree to the expense of annual SOC 2 type type two audits. Let me take a jab at that, and I'm kind of working my way backwards, and then uh, Brenda, I'll definitely uh, give you the floor as well, because uh, I'm sure you have experience in this. Uh, so I, I will kind of work my way backwards. So I would say, you know, uh, every vendor, and I like to break it down by engagement, because a vendor can have multiple engagements, and those engagements may have different risk profiles. So I would say that every engagement uh, has a, a level of characteristic. Uh, they may not, 
they may, in this case, may be sharing uh, PII. They may be sharing a voluminous amount of PII. Uh, they may be heavily regulated because of the data that's involved. So in cases like that, it's very, very important to understand, you know, based on engagement characteristics, but this is not unique to uh, an engagement that has PII, but all engagements have a, a risk profile, knowing what those risks are, understanding what controls are relevant to mitigate those risks, and then being able to collect uh, evidence accordingly to your satisfaction that those controls are in place by design and working effectively. So now to answer your question. So when I look at that SOC 2 type 2, I totally agree. I think that some vendors are small and cannot afford a, a SOC 2 type 2. So I do not mandate that. Uh, what I would say is, hey, knowing the risk characteristics of this uh, engagement, understanding the types of controls that I'm going to look for as mitigants, do you have these controls in place in the event you don't have a SOC 2? What other ways can you provide me a level of assurance, some level of evidence that these controls are in place and meeting your expectations? Sometimes I've had cases where they're shared uh, their audit reports, uh, which is a company that has an independent audit team. Uh, sometimes we have come in and actually done on-site or remotely connected to WebEx so we can understand the type of evidence they're providing us. So I would say, you know, uh, the core of this is, do you understand the engagement characteristics, uh, the associated risk and threats to those engagements, the controls that are really relevant as mitigants, and then uh, being able to ask them evidence of those controls. Uh, and again, if it's a, a small shop, uh, I can totally empathize as to why a SOC 2 or any type of SOC report can be very uh, cost prohibitive for them. Yeah, I would add on to that. My three things are, number one, have an information classification model. Know what content, if it's data, if it's sensitive information, if it's geopolitical, what are those things that make them a higher tiered engagement? And then apply relevant assessments. So only ask what's important for the engagement. Don't ask them everything under the sun. We've got questionnaires that are hundreds and hundreds of questions or thread and tell that's throwing all everything under the sun. How do you know what is important from a threat monitoring perspective versus everything that the company has available to them? So really honing in on the due diligence part. And then um, finally, having the risks that are identified as your key controls. Those are the things you want to focus on. It doesn't mean that everything else that you find out that may not be at the at par security posture isn't important, but the things that are critical, that are must-haves for you to be working with them, those are the ones you want to focus on first, and then you can bubble up the other ones after those are resolved. All good points. You know, I, I always tell people that when it comes to controls, if you are asking for apples, uh, make sure that you don't inadvertently ask for oranges, right? You got to know what you're asking for so that you can be very precise uh, when it comes to uh, controls. Agreed. Thank you. Um, what, it looks like time for one final question. Um, I was just typing a response to someone who said that they couldn't see the poll. So sometimes we've seen in Zoom that uh, the poll, depending on the, the platform that you're using, doesn't show up. I'll just read the question, and if it's something that you're interested in, uh, just go ahead and ping me. Um, you can ping me at info at prevalent.net and I'll get that. But the question was, are you looking to augment or establish a third party risk program this year? So, you know, based on the, the robust conversation today, is it, is it uh, would you like to be engaged with prevalent to, to try to uh, see how we can take a look at your program and, and see if there's any room for us to help? Uh, so next question uh, in the Q&A section is, What's next and final question is what's the suggestion on risks associated with a third party onwards? Oops, sorry, I'm reading the wrong one and I didn't understand that question, so I skipped it. Next one. What are the best ways to evaluate the financial risk of a non public vendor, is particularly when they're not willing to share their financial details? Hopefully that one made sense. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a jab at this. Uh, private companies um, do not have uh, publicly available financial reports uh, like uh, public companies do, right? Like 10K reports and the year reports. Those things are not publicly available. They're not obligated either uh, by law uh, to produce those. Uh, private companies uh, not, don't by law have to share such information. Uh, in situations like that, we always rely on relationships. Uh, relationships between uh, 
the uh, business who are doing business with that vendor. You know, how do I work with the uh, business representative uh, to get uh, financial statements from an entity that normally does not share uh, financial statements? Building relationship with the vendor itself. Uh, and I mentioned that earlier, the importance that uh, we build relationship with vendors because they are our partners. But, you know, to make a long story short is leveraging relationships that are in place uh, to get uh, financial report from private companies. And I would add to that, if, if the relationship is being built and in lieu of getting that content, you can use business intelligence because there's a bunch of other things that we can look at from a business perspective while that financial information is either um, being opposed or uh, being agreed to share. Excellent. Thank you. Um, looks like we're at the top of the hour, so we're going to wrap this up. Thanks so much, Nasser. Thank you, Brenda. Appreciate your time. Um, thanks to everyone who joined, and we're looking forward to seeing you on the, the next webinar. Have a good afternoon, evening, morning, whatever it is. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you both. Have a good day. Thank Bye. you.